Moments later, Kelly and Michelle frantically started calling their mom's cell phone. No answer. They decided, against police advice, to head to St. Paul on the Lake Catholic Church. It looked like a straight out of a movie scene. Bright lights, chaos, and a full-fledged crime scene greeted them as they approached the church that night. It was a search for a missing person who was never reported missing. As we're driving up Lakeshore, there's a helicopter circling the water with a spotlight. There's caution tape surrounding the vehicle. There's officers all around, like a crime scene, but we hadn't reported her missing. She wasn't missing to us, so how is all of this going on? Then they're telling us that she's in the water. We go, no, she's not. Why did you say, no, she's not? Not our mom. Our mom would never be in the water. She did not like the water. To understand how we got here, we need to rewind a few hours. This is Lieutenant Andrew Rogers in a taped deposition. He is from Gross Point Farms Police. Lieutenant Rogers was the first to spot Joanne's car in the church parking lot that night. He ran the plates at 858, but deemed no action was necessary. Do you know if there were any footprints leading from that car to the summit, to the embankment? I did not see any footprints leading from the car across the roadway. According to testimony, about an hour later, Gross Point Farms police officer Keith Colombo came on scene, ran a second lien on the car at 958. The Lexus had been in the lot now for about two and a half hours after the church service. Across Lakeshore Drive. I saw imprints uh, in the uh, snow in the embankment. How far away from the vehicle were those footprints? 75 feet. Colombo testified he went to the lakefront and did not see any return footprints from the water's edge. I believe that there was somebody uh, in the water. And that is when Colombo said the investigation into the disappearance of Joanne Matuk began. Why in the world the police somehow made this conclusion within five minutes. They see a car parked in a church, no footprints going from the car to the water, but some, something apparently gives them the impetus to look 150 feet away in a snowbank by the lake. The absurdity of coming up with that conclusion within five minutes without a person being reported missing, without doing an investigation into whether or not she was missing. Now I want to show you the scene, minus the snow, of course. According to police, Joanne Matuk left the church, crossed the street, and then came here to this embankment. She would have to crawl over huge slabs of concrete and over barriers into the water. Now remember, back in 2010, Lake St. Clair was much more shallow. She would have to walk two football fields long into the water in her high heels to reach a level where she would drown herself. And in order to jump in the water to kill herself, she would have had to negotiate the type of obstacles that I think would be difficult for a, uh, you know, someone in the military, let alone a four foot 10, 250 pound uh, housewife that is not in peak physical condition and is wearing high heels. Scott Bernstein is an author, historian, and investigative reporter. I mainly work on stories and investigations that involve organized crime and uh, mob hits. The death of Joanne Matuk sparked his curiosity. This is clearly not a suicide, and that this is a homicide and needs to be treated as such. One big issue of concern, the time police arrived at Joanne's home. The daughters say it was 924. Minutes later, they started frantically calling their mom. If you look at my client's phone records, those phone calls take place between 930 and 945, not between 1030 and 1045. Leaves you wondering, how could police arrive at an address 30 minutes before the car lien was run that caused all the suspicion. Remember, Officer Colombo ran the lien at 9.58, and that's when he said, under oath, the investigation began. It leaves a lot of questions, and, and it kicks this, in my opinion, this whole sprawling conspiracy off quite dubiously. Now, to another questionable timeline. According to U.S. Coast Guard records, Gross Point Farms Police contacted the Coast Guard at 9.30. 
Now you're looking at the Coast Guard records that are kept in Zulu time, which translates to 9.30 that time of year. The crew was launched at 9.38 and arrived on scene at 9.51, there to search for the missing mother. But if you follow the police timeline, the Coast Guard records would seem to be impossible. Remember, police said they arrived at the house at 1024 after they ran the lean at 958. It leaves you wondering, how then would the Coast Guard be notified at 930 a search was needed? Something isn't adding up. A conspiracy? Bad record keeping? Well, actually, it could be bad record keeping. Handwritten reports state the Coast Guard was first called at 1035. So you have two different reports from one agency reporting two different times. Oh, just wait, there's more. 70 days later, Joanne's body is washed ashore in Canada, found by some fishermen. Her clothes and shoes giving some strange clues to what may have happened to her. How is she full body clothed, shoes impeccable condition, clothing in, in impeccable condition? It's just not gonna happen. Her body was placed in the water somewhere near that area. The autopsy reports leaving as many questions as answers. As we discover, Joanne died with no water in her lungs.